Uh, well, uh, welcome. Um, so we're going to talk briefly about um, a book which has just been published by MIT Press um, on making the bomb, a fissile material approach to nuclear disarmament and nonproliferation. And the book is on sale just outside here. I feel like I'm in one of these, uh, you know, Colbert Report or something. <laughs> um, uh, I'm Hal Fiveson. I retired a year ago, July, after a, a long, long time at the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, Frank von Hippel um, also retired uh, as is a professor at the Woodrow Wilson School Emeritus, and is now a senior research uh, senior research physicist at the um, Woodrow Wilson School. Um, uh, Zia Mian is a research scientist at, um, the, at the Woodrow Wilson School. And the fourth author, uh, Alex Glaser, is a, an assistant professor jointly with the engineering school and the Woodrow Wilson School. And all four of us are members of something called the Program in Science and Global Security at the um, Woodrow Wilson School. Um, so here's a picture of the uh, Nagasaki bomb. That little black speck you see uh, is um, the plutonium core of the weapon, um, about six kilograms of plutonium. Frank will tell you later how much plutonium there now is in, in the world. Um, from, from the very beginning of the atomic age, um, scientists uh, warned about the dangers inherent in nuclear power and fission material. Um, fission material is, um, as Frank will describe later, is um, notably uh, plutonium or highly enriched uranium, which are the essential ingredients for any nuclear weapon. Um, this picture um, was taken almost 60 years to the day, October third, 1954, at what was then the Princeton Inn and is um, uh, now Forbes College. Um, it shows four of the scientists who were most active in warning about the dangers of fission material, all Nobel Prize winners, um, and, um, and of course, quite famous physicists. Um, Niels Bohr, as early as 1944, um, cautioned that um, fission material could become a perpetual menace to the world. James Frank, in 1945, led a group of Manhattan um, uh, project scientists um, arguing that the development of nuclear power is fraught with infinitely greater dangers than were all the inventions of the past. Albert Einstein, as uh, you may know, called for a nuclear abolition in, um, in 1955. Uh, and um, and Isidore Rabi, uh, a, a great scientist at uh, Columbia University, um, uh, advised the US government um, not to pursue, pursue thermonuclear weapons, which of course was the hot topic in the early 50s, uh, since their, quote, very existence and the knowledge of their construction presents a danger to humanity as a whole. Uh, and it's these dangers that motivated uh, our book. Uh, Frank and Zia will in a minute elaborate further, but uh, first let me say something um, more personal about my own involvement with um, nuclear weapons and fission materials, and the evolution of, of, of our program. Um, well, going way back, I joined the Science Bureau of the um, U.S. Arms Control Agency in 1963. This was after a master's degree in physics at UCLA and a master's in international affairs here at, at the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, uh, in those years, I focused mostly on nuclear proliferation dangers and um, was involved in the drafting of the nonproliferation treaty, especially the part that focused on safeguards on civilian nuclear power to make sure 
<coughs> that it wasn't diverted to weapons uses. Um, this was at a time in the early 60s that um, President Kennedy worried that there could be 10 to 20 nuclear weapon states by 1980. Um, the treaty has been pretty effective. Um, there are now only nine nuclear weapon states, um, but also there is a growing concern, which we'll hear more about, that certain civilian technologies, notably uranium enrichment and spent fuel reprocessing, uh, could place countries very close to a nuclear weapons capability should they decide to go, uh, to go for nuclear weapons. Um, this concern is at the heart of negotiations now going on over the Iran, Iranian nuclear program. Uh, the danger that countries could move closer to weapons step by step through their civilian power program, uh, latent proliferation, I called it, uh, was a subject of uh, my PhD thesis at the Woodrow Wilson School actually um, in 1972, a long, long time ago. Um, and it was the looming um, expansion of breeder reactor programs that uh, most worried me then. Uh, a breeder reactor uses plutonium as a fuel and produces more plutonium than it uses up. And, and Frank will say more about that in, in a moment. Um, this concern about breeders uh, also motivated the first research project project at our newly formed Princeton Program on Nuclear Policy Alternatives, um, which was, yipes, uh, 40 years ago that um, we started it. It was part of the old Center for Energy and Environmental Studies that Rob Sokolow directed for, for many years. Um, Frank and I and our colleague uh, at the time, Bob Williams, who's now uh, in the Princeton Environmental Institute, um, sought to show in several papers that breeder reactors and its essential complement, spent fuel reprocessing, were dangerous, not economic, and not needed. Um, in some degrees, these, these studies um, provided the technical backup to political decisions taken by the Ford and, and Carter administrations. Uh, we were joined for a time by Ted Taylor. Um, Ted for a short period was a member of the Princeton faculty. At Los Alamos, he was America's most innovative nuclear bomb designer. Uh, but um, in later years, he became a strong proponent, proponent for nuclear disarmament. Ted, Ted was featured in a book by John McPhee, The Curve of Binding Energy, that I, I suspect several of you have, have, have read. Um, in the years following, our uh, group at Princeton worked on a range of nuclear weapons and fissile material issues, many of which, of which are featured in the, in the book. Um, the overall goal of this work was to show the technical basis for arms control, nonproliferation, and disarmament um, initiatives. In 2006, we organized and have since led an international group, the International Panel on Fissile Materials. The panel now consists of independent scientists, diplomats, and activists from 18 countries, uh, including all the nuclear weapon states except Israel and North Korea. Um, these independent experts um, are dedicated to educating their governments about the dangers of fissile materials and ways to reduce those dangers. And our book draws heavily on studies and reports uh, of the international panel. Um, so let me now turn this over to uh, Frank and Zia. Um, Frank will talk about part one, the problem, and, uh, and Zia, part two, what is, uh, what is to be done. And, um, uh, and they'll both of them focus on um, how um, focusing on fissile material can advance the goals of nuclear disarmament, nonproliferation, and keeping nuclear weapons out of the hand of terrorists. And finally, I, one thing I meant to mention is that in that 
picture, the second, Sneel was born, the far left, and next to him is James Frank, who's Frank's grandfather. So Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is a, a tale of two isotopes, uh, and uh, uh, one is uh, in nature, found in nature, uh, uranium-235, uh, it, it, but in nature, it's, it, fortunately, it's only seven-tenths of a percent of natural uranium. Uh, but when it's highly enriched, uh, typically 90 percent or over, uh, it's uh, you know, you, you can start an explosive chain reaction in it. And uh, the, in fact, the, the first bomb, Hiroshima bomb, uh, used highly enriched uranium. The other isotope is plutonium-239, uh, which is an artificial isotope, has a 24,000 year half-life, and uh, is produced in, in reactors uh, by the absorption of neutrons on the other isotope of, of uh, uranium. Uh, uranium-238, and it was the, uh, you saw that little ma uh, material in the, in the picture of the Nagasaki bomb, uh, uh, where, um, uh, of which on, uh, one out of six kilograms fissioned, but released a, an explosive power equivalent to 20,000 tons of highly high explosive. So, so that, so both materials uh, were in in uh, the debut of the nuclear age. Well, from that very early beginning, uh, we we have the um, this huge buildup. Uh, in 1949, uh, we detected uh, the Soviet first Soviet test, and at that point things went crazy. Uh, we we had only a few hundred bombs of Nagasaki type bombs. At that point, uh, we built up to 30,000 and uh, the Soviet Union built up even higher. So we had a total of 65,000 bombs at the peak, at, at, the, end, toward, at the end of the Cold War. Uh, we're, we've gone down a lot. Uh, we're down to ten, t only 10,000 nuclear weapons. Uh, and. Uh, there, and there are, uh, in that lighter yellow bar uh, there, uh, there are uh, an additional 6,000 uh, weapons or so, uh, which uh, are in a queue for dismantlement. They've, uh, they've been handed over uh, for dismantlement. Uh, but the, um, if you look, now we, now we look inside these weapons, or uh, former weapons, and you look at the materials, and it's starting with highly enriched uranium, and the, uh, the, the dark yellow is our estimate of how much of that uh, uranium was in the weapons. Uh, and then you see it's, it's declined a lot as the, as the uh, weapons, number of weapons has declined. Uh, and there's some in the, uh, in the weapons which are still uh, uh, left to dismantle. Uh, but the but um, what about the rest of it? Uh, well, some of it was eliminated, uh, and I'll talk about how that happened. But a lot of it hasn't been. Uh, one one reason is is that the U.S. Navy the U and the U.K. Navy, Russia, Russia uh, as as well, uh, their their nuclear submarines and nuclear powered aircraft carriers are fueled with weapons-grade uranium, in the case of the U.S. and U.K. It's weapons-usable uranium in the case of uh, Russia. So, so, so there's, um, there's a reserve there for, for future use in naval reactors. Uh, and then, but then there's all this other stuff, which we could, in fact, turn back into weapons uh, if, if, um, if, if we decided. And so that the, the reductions, to make them more reversible, we should, we should get rid of this stuff. Uh, the, uh, let me just jump ahead for a second. Uh, how do, how uh, do we get rid of it? We, we basically reverse this enrichment process, uh, dilute it with U-238 down, and 
it turned, it's, and it, uh, we've been diluting it down to uh, four to five percent uh, enriched uranium, which is the enrichment that's used for, for nuclear power reactors. Now, most of that reduction that I showed you, uh, about 500 tons of weapons grade material, which is enough for 20,000 weapons. Uh, has act was actually diluted on the Russian side, they s and they sold, it us, sold us the low enriched uranium that resulted, uh, and we've used it for a power reactor. So half of the U.S. nuclear power plants for about 20 years were fueled by blended down Russian highly enriched uranium. Uh, as I showed you, however, we, we, we could actually um, we, there's much more where that came from. Um, now, if, if you look at, I mean, it's not just the U.S. And, and Russia, but it's almost just the U.S. and Russia. You, you can see this really is a legacy of the Cold War uh, with this, this white part of the bar as material that's gone. Uh, and you see over here, the U.S. is the only country which has announced a reserve for naval reactors. That's how much is reserved for naval reactors. And then there's uh, a lot in spent naval reactor fuel, too. And then the green, the light green stuff is, is uh, stuff that still to be blended down. Dark green stuff is stuff that is used for uh, research reactor fuel. Uh, the, the, we're in the process of, of moving away from uh, research reactors fueled by highly enriched uranium to low enriched uranium. And over here, you see non-weapon states uh, have, uh, which have been a, a, a huge focus of a, of a clean-up effort to, to, uh, to clean up all the, um, the, the weapons-grade uranium that, that, um, that the U.S. and the Soviet Union uh, sh shipped to countries like Libya and Iraq and, and so on uh, as uh, when we were trying to line countries up to our side of the Cold War. Now, that doesn't seem like very much, the 15 tons here, but uh, it's, it's enough for um, about 600 nuclear weapons. So you can see the, you can see the scale of this, of this uh, the 10,000 weapon equivalents. So plutonium, uh, you, see, you see again the same rise and fall of the, uh, of the weapons and, uh, you know, with, and the plutonium in the weapons. Uh, and you see the uh, again the picture of of uh, plutonium, which has been declared excess and which has not yet been eliminated. Uh, it's 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 more difficult to eliminate, but it's it's to be eliminated. Uh, and then you see this this military plutonium is still in the military sector, which could be used uh, to to uh, build up again. Uh, so once, once again, we have to declare more of this excess and get rid of it. Now, but you also see on top of that uh, something you didn't see or only on a very much smaller scale in the HEU picture, a lot of civilian plutonium. Uh, and and the, the, uh, this is a legacy, not of the Cold War, but a, a legacy of the dream of plutonium breeder reactors. Uh, here, and, and just before I get to that, that dream, uh, you can see because of this civilian material, uh, there are actually uh, five countries with a huge, which dominate the uh, plutonium picture, not just the U.S. and the Soviet Union from the, from the Cold War, but also U.K., Japan, France, uh, and because they had major... Uh, civilian plutonium programs. So what was that about? Uh, what it was about was uh, that there were, in, in the 1970s, there was a prediction that nuclear power was going to grow like this. What actually happened was this. And these, these uh, out to today, and these are the projections. In term, this is in terms of billion watts uh, of, uh, of, of uh, power. Uh, but but the, the people said, in fact, the IEA reported uh, 
uh, that there wasn't enough, wasn't going to be enough uranium for all these reactors that they were expected to be built. And therefore, we had to use, to go to a new type of reactors, which would be fueled not by the U-235, this 0.7% of natural uranium, but by the U-238 by turning it all into plutonium. Those were so-called plutonium breeder reactors. And, well, um, today, we, you know, as you said, we don't have that much, but we project, predict the, uh, the estimates of how much low enriched uranium is around. This is, this is how much they thought at this point that we'd have to be transitioning to the plutonium breeder reactors. Well, that point now has moved up here, way above where we are. And so, so the, um, and, and it turned out that these plutonium breeder reactors uh, that were uh, being proposed to be built were not going to be cooled by water like our ordinary reactors, but by liquid sodium. Liquid sodium burns when it's in contact with, with uh, water or air, and, and, uh, and we live in a world of water and air, so that causes a lot of difficulties. <laughs> and uh, and, and, the, and the, these, these reactions were never commercialized. But we have that legacy of, of, uh, of, of civilian. We were getting ready to start these up by separating the plutonium out of the spent fuel of uh, our current generation reactors. And so now we have to have a problem. What do we do with that? Um, so... <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, so the answer is in here. <laughs> Thank you and goodbye. <laughs> okay. Um, the issue of what to do with these large stockpiles of nuclear weapons usable material that's both the material that's in the weapons, the material that was in weapons but now is in components and could be made back into weapons, and the material that was never in weapons or meant for weapons but exists, uh, including in civilian use, but could be made into a weapon, is you know, one of the big challenges that we face because the presumption, and we've seen it now with the crisis over relations with Russia, and the prospect of a great power competition with China, that the idea that Cold Wars are a thing of the past may not be as robust a conclusion as we may have thought some years ago. And so the idea that the reduction of nuclear weapons that we've seen in the past is part of a glide path to ever lower numbers and eventually the elimination of nuclear weapons is no longer an obvious outcome at least as obvious as we had hoped for some years ago. So there's a question about, as Frank mentioned, how to make sure that nuclear weapons numbers continue to get smaller and that they do so irreversibly and that crises don't lead back up in an increase in nuclear weapons numbers and that new countries don't start making nuclear weapons and that terrorists don't get access to already made nuclear weapons material to make into nuclear weapons. So those are the challenges. And as Frank mentioned, if you do the arithmetic, there may be 16,000 nuclear weapons in the world today. There's enough material for 10 times that many. So th the good thing is that the dedicated production of these fissile materials, the highly enriched uranium and plutonium for weapons has largely ended in the major nuclear weapon states, by which I mean the United States, Russia, Britain, France, and China, the first five countries that went nuclear and built the largest stockpiles of weapons and of material for nuclear weapons programs. So they've all stopped making it for weapons, in some cases several decades ago, because they had so much material already stockpiled. And so in the case of Russia, the last plutonium production reactor was shut down. And the scene that looks like a mourning ceremony at the left-hand side is the shutdown of their last reactor. China actually built underground nuclear reactors for making plutonium for weapons. And they decided they didn't need them, so they just shut them down. It's inside that mountain. It's now actually a tourist attraction. And in the United States, which was the first country to make both highly enriched uranium 
and plutonium because of the Manhattan Project during World War II, has actually shut down its facilities. And this picture is of a uranium enrichment plant, has shut them down and now actually has been demolishing them. So in that sense, the possibility of these countries beginning large new production programs right, would be an enormously costly program because their facilities are shut down. But there is conduction that continues on a smaller scale than what we saw in the Cold War uh, for weapons. There is production of highly enriched uranium uh, for military use. That means both for weapons and for, in the case of India, for making fuel for their nuclear submarine program. And so India, Pakistan, and possibly North Korea are the only countries now still making highly enriched uranium for military purposes. And Russia, which had stopped, has just announced the resumption of making highly enriched uranium for civilian use. It is actually going to make highly enriched uranium to sell to France to make fuel for a reactor in Germany. Um, the other nuclear material, plutonium, there is continuing production also um, in India, in Israel, in Pakistan, and um, in North Korea. And in the case of Pakistan in particular, there is a large expansion of its production base. It's actually building new reactors to make plutonium. The third one just started last year, and the fourth one is almost finished. And this is why people say that Pakistan has the fastest growing nuclear arsenal in the world, because it's still making new facilities to make nuclear weapons material. Uh, Israel has the distinction that its reactor at Dimona is now the oldest operating weapons plutonium production reactor in the world. It's now been running for 50 years. Um, the, as Frank mentioned, plutonium is also made for civilian use in civilian nuclear power programs, even though there's no need for it in nuclear programs and it makes no economic sense and it creates a whole set of problems for the people who work at these facilities as well as for the environment. And these countries are France, UK, Russia, India, and Japan has a large reprocessing plant, which it has been trying to get operating for a long time, but hasn't quite managed it yet. And it's not clear if it will now begin operating or when. Will you please proceed? Yeah. yeah. And the good news in all this is that um, the UK has announced that in 2018, it's going to shut down its last remaining plutonium reprocessing. So, um, but you can see that, you know, there is continuing production, but in terms of, in comparison to what the US and Russia were doing during the Cold War, this is at a very small scale, but you can see it's distributed around the world. And one of the big policy challenges is how to get all of these countries to see sense on this issue. And one of the hopes that the international community has had for a long time has been the idea of an international treaty that would ban the production of these materials, at least for weapons purposes. This is an idea that actually goes back to the 1950s. And at the end of the Cold War, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution unanimously to begin talks on a treaty that would ban the production of these materials for weapons purposes. That was over 20 years ago. Those talks have still not started. And for the, at least for the last 10 or so years, the obstacle to these talks has been Pakistan because it's expanding its program. And the last thing it wants is a treaty that would stop it from using the facilities that it's been building. It sees itself as in an arms race with India. And unlike the enormous effort that has gone into trying to deal with Iran's nuclear program, there is nothing comparable in trying to get Pakistan to agree to allow these talks to begin. And at least for, more, for the last 10 years, the reason was the war in Afghanistan. Fighting Al-Qaeda was more important than Pakistan building nuclear weapons, and so nobody said anything. Um, hopefully that will change. Um, but it's not enough to stop the production of these materials for weapons purposes. Because as Frank mentioned, where we're seeing real growth now is actually in the production of plutonium 
in civilian programs, and more than half of all the plutonium in the world now is actually from civilian programs. So we need to end the production of both highly enriched uranium in Russia for civilian purposes and plutonium production in these other countries for civilian purposes. And that gets tied into questions about the economics of nuclear energy in those countries and the capture of policy making in those countries by the large state-owned corporations that manage these facilities. So ending production is one thing. There are large stockpiles and people who use this material for certain kinds of activities. And as has been mentioned, the use of highly enriched uranium except for weapons is as fuel in certain kinds of reactors. There are naval reactors. So the picture at the top is the Nautilus, which was the first nuclear submarine in the world. It was a US nuclear submarine. And as Frank mentioned, US nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers now are powered by fuel made from directly weapons usable, highly enriched uranium. Um, and more than half the naval reactors in the world are actually in US vessels. So the big problem here is the US nuclear navy and getting them to think about how to convert their submarines from using highly enriched uranium to using low enriched uranium that couldn't be used for nuclear weapons directly. And it can be done. <coughs> Sorry? It's still highly enriched uranium when it's spent fuel and comes out of the submarine. And there's a huge naval stockpile of stuff waiting to go into naval fuel. But the point here is that there's no reason why submarines have to run on this kind of fuel. Right? The French actually used to have submarines that run on highly enriched uranium, and they converted to using low enriched uranium. And we think the Chinese, have, from the beginning, used low enriched uranium. So it can be done. You can build submarines if you want to have nuclear submarines. Uh, but it doesn't have to use weapons usable, highly enriched uranium as fuel. Uh, the obstacle here, as I said, is the US nuclear navy. In the case of research reactors that use highly enriched uranium, the, as Frank mentioned, the US and Russia spread these research reactors around the world as part of their Cold War competition. And there's been a program for quite some time to bring this material back to prevent it uh, being captured by terrorists or whatever. And the issue here, though, is that half the research reactors in the world that still use highly enriched uranium are in Russia, and the Russians don't take that problem seriously. So there is the Russian nuclear research and development establishment that is the problem. In the case of plutonium, the number of countries that use, uh, that produce plutonium and for use in power reactor fuels, France, the UK, Russia, India, um, it's going to have to be a country by country strategy to try and figure out how to get them to uh, roll back these programs because of the specifics of who controls policy um, and what those policy goals are in these countries. But there is success, as, as I mentioned. Um, the UK has decided it's had enough. And there is a debate growing in France about the future of nuclear power in France and about the cost of uh, this reprocessing and using plutonium. India, which is at the beginning of this process, um, you know, hasn't quite got a debate of the same kind of level, but uh, it, we're trying to start one. You know, our colleague here, M.V. Ramana, has been leading the, the charge on this. So the next question is that there's all this material. You can stop making it and you can stop using it, but there's still a lot of material sitting around. And so you'd want it to be as safe as possible until we can figure out what to do with it. And people have recognized the risk of, you know, the vulnerability of nuclear material to theft and so on. Uh, as uh, Hal Fiverson mentioned, uh, Ted Taylor, when he was here in the book that John McPhee wrote about him, warned about the risk of terrorism by people getting their hands on this kind of material. And so the US, you know, has led the charge in trying to make the world understand the problem of the vulnerability of nuclear material. And it has built this dedicated, super-duper secure facility for its highly enriched uranium. It contains 100 tons of uh, highly enriched uranium. And these three people at the bottom, an 83-year-old nun, and one person who was 57 and the other 64, you know, non-violent peace activists, broke through the security of the facility 
you know, got all the way to the walls of this building. And there are other buildings on this site <coughs> where there is material. But the fact that these people could break into this kind of facility, and when the US government investigated the reason for the failure of security at this site, the, the catalog of failure was damning. Everything that could have gone wrong was obviously went wrong, according to their own analysis of the, of the failures. And so these three people are now serving long prison sentences for basically showing that nuclear security in the United States, despite spending a fortune, is um, not that great. And that raises questions about how secure these materials are in other countries. Now, you could say, well, you know, so it may be insecure, but what's the problem? The single largest theft of nuclear weapons usable material that we know of took place from the United States. It was highly enriched uranium from a facility that was making naval fuel. Right? And it wasn't stolen by a terrorist group. It was stolen by a foreign government, Israel, in the 1960s. And there have been concerns about theft from the old former Soviet complex. And so that makes you wonder about how safe facilities holding these materials are in other countries. So you can't store it indefinitely and expect that it'll stay safe. So then how do you get rid of it? As Frank mentioned, with highly enriched uranium, you can basically dilute it back to a form where it can't be used for weapons without having to enrich it again. Or in the case of naval fuel, once you've taken it out of the, sh the submarine or the ship, the, what highly enriched uranium is left in the core, you can just leave it in there. And so the radiation barrier from the other decay products and fission products you know, will protect it from being easily stolen and recovered. But the best thing to do is to leave the plutonium in the spent fuel. Don't separate it at all and let the radiation barrier from the fuel act as a protection for as long as it can until we find geological repositories and put the stuff securely underground. Um, but there's also lots of plutonium that's already been separated from spent fuel, right? And so there, one of the ideas that um, <coughs> is worth exploring at least, and there hasn't been a, a proof yet of how well this would work, is actually to think about drilling very deep boreholes you know, and this graphic takes the borehole down to about six kilometers, and to actually place the plutonium in waste form down um, these boreholes so that it would be very, very difficult for anybody ever to get it back out again. And so that begins the process of trying to roll back these giant stockpiles that we have accumulated. Um, but it does become urgent when you take into account the fact that there are geopolitical tensions, there are risks of proliferation, there are worries about terrorism and so on. So time is not necessarily on our side on this issue. So the, to wrap up, the whole idea of the nuclear chain reaction that powers nuclear weapons uh, was actually uh, thought up in 1933 by Leo Szilard, um, a Hungarian physicist who for a while actually lived in Princeton. And there was a time after Szilard thought of the idea of fission when the idea of nuclear weapons started to circulate among uh, scientists before the first nuclear weapon was actually built. In fact, before the Manhattan Project started, where Szilard hit upon the idea that the answer to the nuclear danger was secrecy. That if we, if scientists didn't talk about this, that it would somehow keep the genie in the bottle for what that was worth. And World War II basically stopped that effort. But what happened was that nuclear weapon states embraced secrecy as a central part of how they managed nuclear programs. And so, except for the United States and to some extent the UK, there's a lot of secrecy about how many nuclear weapons countries actually have and how much nuclear weapons material they've made. So the figures that we showed earlier on, except for the US and the UK, 
those figures are our best estimates based upon trying to reconstruct the historical record and model the different kinds of facilities that countries have used for making these materials. And so there's a lot of uncertainty there. And if we're going to make sure that we've accounted for all the nuclear weapons material in the world as part of getting rid of it, we have to actually know how much we have. And so for that, an important step forward is to move away from the overwhelming concern being one of secrecy, at least about telling us how much stuff you made. We actually need nuclear weapon states to be much more transparent so that we can start to think about what exactly is the scale of the problem that we're dealing with and then make policy steps towards addressing those challenges. The second thing, though, is that if a country says, oh, I made 100 tons of it and I've got rid of it, would you believe them? And the answer is it depends who you are. Right? And so more and more we've started to understand the critical necessity for verification independently of what countries do with their nuclear weapons materials. So when a country dismantles nuclear weapons, and the United States and the Soviet Union, as you could see from the chart, have dismantled thousands, tens of thousands, and there are thousands awaiting dismantlement. But no independent witnesses to that dismantlement actually exist. And so one of the things we need to think about is how we can put in place mechanisms for verifying the dismantlement of nuclear weapons, making sure that the fissile material components that came out of those weapons are actually all accounted for and that they are then in turn disposed of in a way that we can all monitor. And so one of the things that we're doing now as part of our program is to think about ideas for exactly how countries can declare how much stuff they made and what technical means there might be for independently monitoring the dismantlement of nuclear weapons and disposing of their fissile materials so that at the end of the road, we actually have some confidence that we've done what we thought we were doing. And so I'll end with the person on the right-hand side of this slide, Joseph Rotblatt, who was a Manhattan Project physicist. So he worked on the US atomic bomb program, and he was the only person that left the program before the, bombing of, before the bombs were finished and the, the bombing of Japan, and dedicated his life to the abolition of nuclear weapons, and for which he and the organization that he helped found and then led for many years. The Pugwash Movement of Scientists uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize. And what Rotblatt pointed out was that just having technical means of verifying things will only take you so far. And so one of the things that he called for was the need for citizens to actually take responsibility <coughs> for what their countries do. And there is no area more important for that responsibility than when it comes to dealing with nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons materials. Thank you. So now we are happy to take your questions. Or answers. <laughs> Germans, they're, they're conventionally 
France to Germany. That's all that's done. Power, Germany, power. Pardon? The triple play that Sia mentioned. Germany, first Russian, Russian and Mediterranean zone, France for fuel production. Oh, that's for Germany. research reactor, for a German research reactor. Can that motivate an Italian project? That was my point. Was his yeah, question? Yeah, it's, it's very strange. Um, Russia has this huge amount of ex excess highly rich uranium. Our speculation is that that the that what they have that they haven't sold us is actually uh, highly rich uranium that first went to to a plutonium production reactor before it being enriched and therefore it's contaminated by uh, by radioactive isotopes that that, uh, that the French fuel fabricators wouldn't like. Uh, so, but it is it, it is still bizarre. I mean, they have they do have the world's largest. It's on a very small scale. <coughs> the the um, on the deep oil safety. I don't know, were you, what, what, what kind of safety were you worried about? I was just wondering how geologically safe the deep bore things are in terms of the half life of plutonium. Yeah. Well, <coughs> the the uh, the idea is to really bore it down into the granite, and which is. So in terms of transparency and you know, what activists are, are, are trying to think about, so we wrote a report uh, a couple of years ago on um, paths to nuclear disarmament. And the last chapter of that report actually deals with this question of, you know, of transparency and of getting information out. I mean, there are obvious historical examples of people like Mordecai Benun who worked in the Israeli nuclear weapons facility came out and alerted the world to the, the scale of what was going on. I mean, I'm sure some governments may have known, but to tell the rest of the world that this is actually what is happening in this facility and that this is the scale of Israeli nuclear weapons material production. It was an enormous act of courage, and for which you know, he spent many, many years in, in jail in solitary confinement. And Rotblat was an outspoken advocate of that Benunu was actually acting out of conscience. And so you're right in that sense that you know issues of transparency and how to do that are important, and people have started to think about this. But you know the answers are right now not obvious as to how one does this in a way where people are able to blow the whistle, so to speak, and be protected. But you know, to be honest, there's a certain element of which you want people to feel that they are protected and can tell these things. But at the same time, we also need to have people appreciate the fact that it is also a question of conscience and of responsibility that if you know this, then regardless of the consequences, like Daniel Ellsberg at the Pentagon Papers and Mordecai Bloom in Israel, you do what's right regardless of the consequence, like the three people who broke into the facility in the United States. That, you know, they said, you're going to send us to jail? Well, fair enough. So both sides are there. And They're very few secrets. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's sometimes surprising. For example, uh, uh, I guess it was uh, 30 years ago, I estimated how much plutonium the Soviet Union had produced. We published it in Scientific American. Uh, based on, there's a, there's a um, when, when you reprocess fuel, there's a krypton 85 of radioactive isotope gets released to the atmosphere and it gets distributed all around the atmosphere. And so then I subtracted out how much we, we produced and, and was able to estimate how much they produced. And that got hung up in, I mean, that was published in Scientific American. And there was a Russian edition and, the, and there was a big struggle in the, in, the, in the Soviet Union about whether they could publish that article. <laughs> but there, there really are, I mean, that's one of the beauties 
is, is that we can, you know, you, you can, the details of nuclear weapon design, modern nuclear weapon design, not the one we showed on the cover, uh, are classified, but, but the nuclear materials are not. Um, maybe you can clarify the IAEA role, uh, the current role in the, in the verification process um, of the dis disarmament. Inspectors, if necessary, sitting at a reactor or a reprocessing plant, um, cameras, uh, and other sorts of uh, tags and seals to make sure that if somebody did try to divert material for weapons, there would be some warning period. The safeguards can't stop a country from doing it, but they could alert the world that it's so it's been pretty successful. The concern now is with um, uh, how many centrifuge plants enriching uranium, where you can't have safeguards. There are safeguards, for example, on the uranium program. But a uh, concern that uh, there wouldn't be a lot of, as much warning time as you'd want if a country wanted to, instead of making low enriched uranium for uranium fuel, reactors would make highly enriched uranium for weapons. That the, the, the time period could be, you know, to, to, to make that change could be maybe weeks or, or months. And um, so that's a concern. Reprocessing also, you're producing plutonium ostensibly for civilian uses, but again, you could just grab that plutonium and use it for weapons again pretty quickly. So that, that is the concern with safeguarding. But the general notion that, that civil, civ, uh, civilian programs, uh, or all the nuclear programs in the non-nuclear countries, uh, can be observed, and if they try to get weapons, would be, would be seen as, has been pretty successful. Now, why did the Glenn Down program stop? Why did it stop? Yeah. You mean the Russian Glenn Down? Yeah, <laughs> it was. So that we did a lot of things, one third as much as they did. Yeah, we we, we uh, uh, the, that contract was made in 1994, I think, and um, for a fixed amount, and uh, and it was completed, and the, and the Russians say now we don't need the money as much as we did then, and we'd like to keep what's left as a reserve, as a national reserve, uh, but both Russia and the U.S. Could declare more excess. Were we willing to blend down alongside the Russians? We, we did. The we did. We well, um, there was it. I mean, it's interesting. I've seen it before. Yeah. They're blending their bodies. Yeah. Were we willing to come down as long as they did? Well, we actually, there was a second declaration of excess on the U.S. side. The first declaration is, was, was quite, <coughs> was about a third of the Russian declaration. Second one, there was a concern that the, the Navy had is you saw that our, our um, enrichment plants have been uh, shut down. They said, well, where are we going to get the highly enriched uranium? And basically, the, the excess bombs have become the fuel for U.S. naval reactors. And so, so uh, uh, in terms of blending down, we're actually, we're, right now, we're in, involved in a debate about blending down more. But, but, um, but, but the but the, to a first approximation, the Navy has, which, which has now about 50 to 70 years 
of fuel into the future based on, on, the, on the stuff that we've dismantled so far and, and could go twice as far. Although, although people say that Russians didn't need the money to make the U.S. share of the brand. Pardon? Although people say that Russians didn't need the, didn't need the money for a second round, the United States shares the blame. You could say that, yeah. Why don't you tell us what you do? <laughs> <laughs> like, like start a movement? <laughs> and so get people interested in this issue? <laughs> Educate Congress people? You know, th those are among the things you do. You know? <laughs> Bob is the, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Bob is the director of the uh, Princeton Peace Action, which is a, uh, a, uh, a peace, well, it's a disarmament group and also a gun control group, uh, which which uh, has has gone far beyond Princeton to to cover half half the state of New Jersey and a good portion of Pennsylvania. Thank you. And uh, I urge you all, after you've read, bought our book, to join the coalition. <laughs> there you go. Peacecoalition.org. <laughs> So that's, in that's war, in, war. Uh, in a wartime? Yeah. Right. Tested, that, of course. Tested. They've been tested, yeah. right. No, I mean in hostile. <coughs> right. So that's 70 years. Right. And what strategy would you say was effective in bringing that about? The fact that they were never used, or is it just pure luck? Yeah. I think it's a combination. I don't know what you all oh, are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's a uh, combination of luck. I mean, uh, you know, we had the near miss with the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and uh, some other uh, cases. But it's also, uh, it's also maybe in part because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, people saw how horrible a nuclear war would be. And, uh, uh, and also, I think, though, citizens' movements, uh, sort of uh, beating the drums about how, you know, how nuclear, well, what, what Reagan and Gorbachev finally said, uh, it's impossible to, what, what is it? it it's, it's, uh, it cannot be won and must never be won. Yeah, nuclear war cannot be won. Cannot be won and must never be won. Yeah, after uh, Reagan said a few th times things that suggested not be thought otherwise. Um, but that, that, there was a huge movement in the 80s, uh, you know, which, you know, Bob and I were in, in, a part of and uh, and uh, uh, which which really uh, and the the whole history of uprisings against the bomb throughout history has sort of created a taboo, which I think really uh, has really uh, to the point where uh, there's a, a morale problem if you're involved in with nuclear weapons in the in the U.S. military, it's considered a dead end uh, sort of uh, job, you know, you know. These things can't be used, and, and so you know if they can't be used, why, why not get rid of them? Yeah, I mean there is there is clearly a taboo against. I hope there's clearly a taboo against nuclear weapons, but there is a kind of uh, tension that I have fully understood. The the um, uh, old sire that the U.S. had for many years, the single. Chiefs, how many people 
things have gotten better, <laughs> I hope, since then, and that uh, there are targeting plans that are more, somewhat more rational, one hopes. Um, but that's always been sort of against what seems politically, polit politically you know, realistic. The George Bundy, who was a national security advisor under Kennedy and Johnson, wrote an article Foreign Affairs, where he talked about these deterrence means killing hundreds of millions of people and so on. He said, one bomb in one city would be a tragedy beyond history, and uh, 10 in 10 cities is in inconceivable. So that no president, and hopefully no head of the power bureau of Russia, would consider <coughs> taking risks that would, that would allow even one weapon that's a pretty powerful taboo, but, but uh, you know, to, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, as Frank mentioned, is pretty scary when one wants to think, think back about it. Um, and to think that we can go on forever with a bunch of countries having nuclear weapons and none of it ever being used is, is I, th I think, sort of a dangerous kind of illusion that you know, we seem to have. I attended a seminar here, not here, the other day or last week, uh, in which the author of a book, I think it was called Command and Control, Command and Control. Yeah. And talked about not what we're talking about, the hostile use of these weapons, but the accidental triggering or explosion of them. And he gave some really frightening examples. You haven't mentioned that. You seem to be more you know, concerned about actually the deliberate use of it. What do you think about the accidental explosion? I mean, what is your concern? Well, they're warehoused and, you know, and accidents happen. Yeah, no, I, it, 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 you know, it's a concern. I think uh, many years ago, Fr Frank and I, with uh, Bruce Blair, who mm -hmm. was at one time a missile control officer at Silo, uh, did a, uh, a uh, we wrote a paper on de-alerting nuclear weapons because of the fear that there could be an accident, where under some mistaken radar blip or something, nuclear weapons are, Three of us were invited to Omaha to the strategic command by uh, General Eugene Havinger, who was our strategic commander at the time, to tell us why we shouldn't worry, <laughs> I guess. And uh, we went there. We didn't convince him at that time, even though now he seems to be more for it. Really. And he didn't convince us. Um, and um, we talked through this. And, and that is really where that seems much more possible accident or inadvertence uh, or uh, mistaken launch, things of that sort. A much more serious issue than, in fact, people deliberately thinking that we're going to use nuclear weapons because it's so clearly suicidal. And now we worry about hacking. We have we have these uh, red team exercises actually, and uh, too many of the re red teams have actually penetrated storage facilities and stolen weapons quantities and material. So it's not just nuns. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so there really is a there really is a you know the the uh, the only way to really secure this material is to get rid of it mm -hmm. ultimately, um, and. Um, you know, the, the, you know, there is a concern that, that um, the terrorists do not share the taboo. I mean, I think there's, there's plenty of reasons to be concerned about that. Uh, and there has been a big effort uh, to clean up these highly enriched uranium for the research reactors we spread around the world. But, there, but it, it has been mostly focused on other, well, you know, other countries. And we haven't 
well, in this country, it's, it's got religion too, and it's, there's been a lot of consolidation. One of the consolidation points is that, <coughs> that material is that that uh, storage facility that, <coughs> that the uh, that the three <coughs> penetrated to. Uh, but it, it, it's it, it really is. Uh, There's two sorts of issues, and I, 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 maybe your question is getting at both of them. One is that a terrorist group could get to a reprocessing plant or a reactor, spend fuel pool, and, and release a lot of radioactivity. That's one sort of danger. The other danger that Frank's talking about is that they could penetrate a research reactor that's using highly enriched uranium or somewhere where they're separating plutonium and actually get weapons material. two separate concerns that one, uh, that one has and has to guard against. Let me make one observation, because part of your question was about how, what would they do with it if they got it? Right, what they want to And um, the question is, it depends on the material. So um, if they managed to steal highly rich uranium, of which there are about 1,400 tons in the world, um, it turns out that if you just <coughs> drop one piece on the other, you'll get a big bang. You won't get a Hiroshima-sized bang, but you'll still get a bang big enough to do serious damage. So mm -hmm. what you imagine weaponizing to be, you know, building something that the United States might have as a nuclear weapon, is actually not the kinds of things that one has to worry about. And so with plutonium, it's much more complicated. As Hal mentioned there, But the point is that it's the concern about nuclear terrorism is especially with the highly enriched uranium. And one of the things that it's important to remember is that the very first bomb that was ever used was the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. That was made from highly enriched uranium. And the design was so simple and so robust it had not been tested. And that was in 1945. So if it didn't need testing in 1945, imagine where we are today with regard to what, how complicated it might be to actually get two pieces of highly enriched uranium to go off in a small, medium-sized nuclear explosion. But the second part of your question was about their taboo. And I want to add to what Frank and Hal said here, because I think that the reason nuclear terrorism is a threat is because the countries with nuclear weapons taught terrorists that nuclear weapons are really powerful things that get you a lot. Right? And so the first thing is, why would they want this thing in the first place? And the answer is because we told them that nuclear weapons are the most powerful weapons and you should be really afraid of anybody that has them. The second thing is that Osama bin Laden at least talked about trying to get nuclear weapons. And the reason he gave was the same reason the United States gives for having nuclear weapons. He said it would be a deterrent. Then, that if we had it, you would be forced to leave us alone so we could do what we want, which is exactly the same reason that the nuclear weapon states use to justify their nuclear weapons. So part of the concern about nuclear terrorism is the fact that nuclear weapons have a way of thinking that goes with them that nuclear weapon states have taught the world. And so we worry about other countries getting them, and we worry about terrorists getting them, but that's because we taught them the nuclear gospel. Yeah? Yeah, I had two questions. Uh, decades ago, I was at, in D.C. at the meeting where they talked about the nuclear winter. I never have heard that, that topic again. And then a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a New York Times an allocation of big bucks to revamp the nuclear program. What is that? Concern is, of course, nuclear weapons bombing cities would be bad enough. But people pointed out in the, in the um, 80s that the smoke 
really big fires can go up the stratosphere and it, and it, and it can uh, spread out and um, block the sun. And recent calculations uh, by uh, Robach uh, up, the, up the street at Rutgers uh, have shown that actually with more advanced modern climate models have, sh have shown that you know, this that would stay up for a long time. And, um, and, the, and the, I mean, it's not that everybody would freeze, but the concern is that the growing season would be shortened to the point that everybody would starve. And that's, that's a real concern. There was a, um, there was a, uh, a National Academy of Sciences study looked at that in, in, uh, in the 1980s. The TAPS report. Pardon? Yeah. TAPS report. Yeah, well, that was, that was yeah. the, uh, the private, the independent report that then triggered the academy report. And you know, some of us are actually urging there to be a, 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 a new report uh, because the same, some of the same authors who made the original point are are saying that even with a small nuclear war, you know, for example, between India, small by U.S. and Russian standards. to convince themselves and Congress that they need to replace all the existing nuclear weapons and modernize the weapons themselves and extend their life. And that we also need a new generation of ballistic missiles, ICBMs, that would carry those nuclear weapons. And we need new submarines to carry the new missiles that would go in the submarines, and new bombers to carry the nuclear bombs, and new cruise missiles to carry nuclear weapons. In other words, to basically bring into the 21st century, as they put it, the whole nuclear weapons establishment and its weapons and its facilities for managing and maintaining and looking after those weapons. And now there's talk of recruiting a new generation of young people to work in all this complex, because there's a crisis there also that they feel. And so the price tag just for the hardware, <coughs> right, the bombs and the missiles and the submarines and, the, and so on, is a trillion dollars over the next 30 years. And these systems are intended and designed to last for many decades because the ones we have today have already lasted many decades and that's the reason why they say, you know, if they're 40 years old, so we need new ones. So when you look at their planning, they're starting to talk about bringing new systems into readiness by 2030, which would last 40 or 50 years after that. So we're talking basically towards the end of the century we still have nuclear weapons and all the things that go with them. The Russians have already announced that they are modernizing theirs also. There is the Chinese are modernizing theirs. The British are stuck in this debate about modernizing theirs. The French have their own modernization scheme underway. And once you think about it this way, then the idea that the Pakistanis or the Indians or the Israelis or the North Koreans are going to say, well, you know, we're just not going to invest in the next generation of nuclear weapons is just not an option. They're going to say nuclear weapons are here basically forever. 40 years is forever as far as the policy is concerned. And so, you know, the concern that we all have is that we may have been lucky for the last 50 or 60 years. The question is, how long do you think our luck will last? Mm -hmm. Can I just add that this is, in a way, one of the perverse results of, of, of arms control in the, uh, in the modern age. You know, the last treaty we had, a, a reductions treaty that we had with uh, Russia was the New START Treaty. It was 2009? 2010. 2010. And uh, one of the commitments that uh, President Obama had to make to get enough votes in the Senate to ratify that treaty was this modernization program. Uh, I know you uh, talked a little about uh, accidental triggering of uh, weapon. But that was uh, based on the false positive. And somebody still needs to uh, to pull the trigger. 
what are the chances that some seismic, uh, massive seismic uh, activity could trigger such a... What are the chances that massive uh, seismic activity could yeah. trigger such a uh, explosion? Yeah, I, I, um, I don't, I haven't heard that, as, uh, that earthquake, but that an earthquake, yeah, 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 yeah. Or, uh, yeah, I mean, there are electrical signals, somehow electrical, I mean, there have been things like somebody's dig been digging with a bulldozer with a, the pipeline, for a pipeline and, and cut the cables to the, uh, to, a, to a set of missiles, of our missiles, uh, so that, and there are, there, there are uh, wor worries about Accidents and and um, but I hadn't heard that particular one. That scenario. So just to, to, to comment on this is the, somebody mentioned the talk last week by uh, the journalist Eric Schlosser and his book Command and Control. A large portion of that book is actually about one accident mm -hmm. at a U.S. intercontinental ballistic missile site where a workman who was doing routine maintenance dropped his tool and the tool punctured the tank of the missile and caused an explosion that threw the warhead off the top of the missile. Right? And that warhead could have exploded. So, you know, one can imagine that seismic event, you know, affecting a silo with a missile in it. You might not launch the missile to you know, another country or whatever, but you might imagine a series of events where the mechanisms that actually prevent the weapon from accidentally detonating, you know, may not all work. Been instances in the past where many of the safety systems in nuclear warheads you know, didn't work, and you know, we were fortunate that the last safety system managed to remain intact and prevent an accidental detonation. So, but people have learned to try and from these mistakes in the past. But the book deals exactly with these kinds of things about how things have gone wrong and people have had to fight long, complicated battles to try and make nuclear weapons safe from these kinds of accidental detonations. But but that's not our book. That's But you are talking, depending too much on luck here, it seems. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if, uh, Frank, I guess, uh, could you describe your pro uh, proposal on uh, plutonium in the bomb? Yeah. That's a, that's a uh, yeah. we, we've been trying to make, throw over the transom suggestions uh, to, to both the uh, Iranian side and the U.S. side uh, on on how to solve the uh, negotiations, and and uh, one of them was how how to uh, reduce the uh, the amount of plutonium this reactor that the Iranians are building uh, uh, reducing the amount of plutonium it produces below a level of concern, and and that has been accepted. That particular suggestion. Uh, there's another suggestion that we just made. Um, uh, this last week uh, of how the Iranians could have more centrif you know, there's a gap between the amount of number of centrifuges, the number of centrifuges that the U.S. wants the Iran to leave with the Iranians and the, the number that they insist on keeping. And we were trying to close that gap by uh, the, you know, with, there's a scenario that, um, that they would enrich already low enriched uranium up, up to weapons grade, and we were just saying, like, uh, proposing a system w which they, they had a just in now, just in time system for producing low enriched uranium, so they wouldn't have enough low enriched uranium to, to, and that would inc increase the number of centrifuges that they could have by a factor of three. And so, uh, I, I, as far as we can tell, that has not, uh, that particular suggestion did not land on, on fertile ground, but will. I'll, I'll know ne more next week, yeah.